Hello friends, Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's Masters. And boy, does that feel good to say. We are finally here, our first major championship of the year. And if you haven't been here for a major, you know this week is going to be awesome from a content side. There's going to be more content than you can even handle. In fact, a lot of it's already out. I've got an in-depth course preview with Mark Immelman. I've got a trends data research video out, and I've even got a video dedicated to Tiger Woods props. That's right. We're going very deep this week, and there's going to be plenty more to come. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel. You're getting notifications because there's going to be a lot of really fun things for this week. All the data that you see is going to be coming from my website, rickrungood.com. It is probably the largest data website dedicated to golf DFS and fantasy millions and millions of data rows from the European tour, the corn Ferry tour, the senior tour, and of course the PGA tour, everything you could possibly imagine. I love it. I'm sure you will too. We're going to go over the course. We're going to go over the player pool. We're going to go over just about everything and we're going to start right now. Augusta National, how about this place, right? Here's the course key stats tool on rickrungood.com. There's a lot going on here, so let's talk through it. Uh, this is, of course, the only major championship that we do see each and every year. So we've got just a multiple of, of data compared to the other major championships. And for the most part, the course plays relatively consistent year in and year out. Obviously, weather can change that, and there are changes that we're going to need to talk to for, tw uh, for 2022, but otherwise, it is relatively consistent, and you're going to hear throughout the week how sticky course history is, and it's true. It's a very sticky uh, course. You know, guys who play well from year over year tend to continue to do that. It also helps that we have a very similar small field every single year 91 golfers in the field thanks to jj spawn winning the valero texas open and punching his ticket into this event harris english with drew so he's out and with the top 50 and ties making the cut a lot of these guys are going to make the cut because the bottom part of this field is your amateurs your past champions guys that might not really have a good chance of making the weekend so you're going to see a lot of the same guys playing four rounds and when that happens the cream rises to the top there are nuances around augusta national it, there, there's just so much to talk about let's jump into it par 72 it's actually going to be stretched out to about 7510 yards this week i'll talk about a couple of holes that were lengthened but if you look on the right hand side of the screen that's the regression model this is uh the calculation that i'm, I'm very very proud of one of my favorite things on the entire website where it looks at the statistics for every player at every course over the last dozen years and it starts to find trends starts to find the types of golfers that have had success at every single course and it's very clear at augusta national that distance reigns supreme off the tee accuracy not so much in fact distance is the sixth ranked stat let me say that again. There are only five other courses in which driving distance is more important than at Augusta National. Driving accuracy, 40th, which means there's only three courses on the PGA Tour schedule in which driving accuracy is less important than at Augusta National. Why is that? Well, very generous fairways. Super easy to hit fairways around here. Just massive acres of fairway. I, I mean, I could hit these fairways. So you don't see a lot of guys playing out of the rough, and the rough isn't even all that penal to begin with. There's basically none of it out there. So uh, that's why when you say, okay, everybody's going to be playing out of the fairway, distance becomes, or accuracy is not that important. And then you combine that with this course being stretched out to like 7,500 yards. Uh, and I think probably playing longer than that. I'll get into that in just a second. Uh, distance is so incredibly important. Then approach play, uh, in terms of the value of uh, of approach play, um, it's huge. It's, it's probably one of the highest correlated stats. There's 12 other courses on the PGA Tour in which uh, strokes gained approach is more important, but approach by itself is always going to be one of the most important stats and no different here at Augusta National. You're going to hear things like experience 
all week long, right? Uh, it's rare for a first-timer to win. Fuzzy Zeller was the last to do it. You're going to see first-timers contend, but it's rare that they're actually going to win historically. And the nuances of the green, the undulation on the greens, the um, the the different levels of, of these fairways, balls always above your feet, always below your feet. It's, it's almost like Kapalua, which is honestly not a bad comp because of those types of shots and because of the wide fairways at Kapalua. All of this is playing into the things that we're going to talk about in this pre in this preview and who's going to play well. The changes for this year. There are uh, three holes that got new greens. Number 11 and number 15 were both lengthened. 11 is an absolute brute. It is the first leg of Amen Corner, 11, 12, and 13. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But 11 was already a hard hole, and now they've lengthened it. Oh boy, scary stuff. Um, the other thing is, it's been a little wet in Georgia, right? Like they've gotten some rain. There is weather in the forecast. Uh, Tuesday, as of right now, looks like they could get some water as well. I'm thinking with the changes, with the weather, driving distance is even more important. I think if they stretch this out to 75-10, it plays longer than that. That's just my my personal opinion. That's kind of what I'm, I'm looking at here um, in the forecast and everything. So I think driving distance, second shot, um, being able to ball strike the heck out of it is certainly going to be a huge advantage this week. Uh, I hate to fall into the criteria of saying, hey, this is a uh, this is a true test, a complete well-rounded test, but it really is. There's, there's just no way you can hide at Augusta national. You can't hide off the tee. You can't hide on approach. You can't hide around the greens and you certainly can't hide on those bent grass putting surfaces. So you really have to be in complete control of your game, but I would defer for longer ball strikers to get themselves around Augusta national. I mentioned amen corner because not only is it arguably the best three hole stretch in our game, in our sport, but there's really going to be a lot of strokes uh, won and lost there. And there's also going to be a lot of wagers won and lost there because they're available for lots of props and things like that. And also what I love about it and what I love about getting into the props is there is a men corner coverage. My friend and colleague over at CBS Sports, Mark Immelman, on the call this week. I had him on my podcast uh, that I released a couple of days ago where we talked about a men corner, right? This guy has seen more shots at Amen Corner than probably anybody else. He's seen probably every every shot hit there over the last couple of years. So it's such a critical, awesome stretch of golf, and we're going to be able to see everything. Uh, the props are not out on prize picks yet, but what I did is I went ahead and I started to create and I pulled the data for Amen Corner. And the link to, to this Google Doc that I'm showing right now to this spreadsheet, it'll be in the description. You can go find this. You can look at the data yourself. So what I think is going to happen here, Amen Corner, par 4, 11, just an absolute brute, the par 3 over uh, over Ray's Creek, um, number 12, and then the uh, the par 5, which is 13, that, that is a little bit, that, that's your that's your chance. That's your gettable, scorable opportunity. And you'll see there are trends in which some of these golfers are able to manage Amen Corner much better than others. So what I believe, when Prize Picks comes out with the props. I think we're going to have to move fast because they could open them at either 11 and a half or 12 and a half total strokes across amen corner. I think it's probably going to be 12 and a half. That would say, are you going to play amen corner at uh, par or better? But there's a chance that they open them at 11 and a half, which would say, are you going to play it under par or par or better? I'm hoping it's 12 and a half, but I've got the data here for both of those. So for example, let's say it is 11 and a half. Um, there are golfers who even at 11 and a half have gotten around amen corner, uh, in that score better than most. Dustin Johnson has played 40 rounds dating back to 2008 at Augusta national. He has gone under 11 and a half, 62% of the time. Uh, he's gone under 12 and a half, 80 percent of the time. Patrick Cantlay, Daniel Berger, they're all going under 11 and a half at 56 percent or better. You can throw Jordan Spieth, Xander Shoffley, Tony Finau in that category. I'm hoping we get it at 12 and a half. If we get it at 12 and a half, there's a huge edge. Even Tiger has played it under 12 and a half in 87 percent of his trips through 40 of them since 2008. Victor, Victor Hovland, he's gone through a man corner under 12 and a half in uh, 87 and a half percent. One more thing, because I think this is so critical. 
I have a feeling Amen Corner could play a lot harder this year just because of the changes to 11. Um, if you get kind of windy conditions throughout the week or even uh, soft conditions, will it'll be harder to get to 13. They'll be able to get there, but it might be a little bit harder. You might hit a couple longer clubs in. I actually don't mind going over 12 and a half for guys like Terrell Hatton. Terrell Hatton has gone all, he's already gone over 12 and a half, 62 and a half percent of the time. Uh, I would say uh, if it plays harder, you're going to see more guys go over. So that's my little amen corner rant. Um, we'll see what prize picks opens with. I have, I have prize picks dedicated tools on my website, rickrungood.com. They're free, or you can also just follow along on Twitter, follow along on the video, use the code Rick. When you sign up at prize picks, there's a link in the description. It'll give you a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. We're going to crush them with fairways and greens and amen corner stuff all week long. So make sure you follow me on Twitter and you watch the scramble Tuesday and Friday with Andy Lack. We give out picks there. But again, use the code Rick, deposit, make sure you get yourself all set up. Here's the cheat sheet. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven golfers over $10,000. Oh my, that's a pretty big range. As you know, with major championships, you do get the softer pricing and it's Scotty Scheffler immediately gains the crown of the number one golfer in the world. And now he's the most expensive golfer in the world at flat 11,000. Uh, John Rahm is 10-8, DJ is 10-5, Justin Thomas is 10-3, and then we round it out with Colin Morikawa, Victor Hovland, and Roy McIlroy at 10-2, 10-1, and $10,000 flat, respectively. So a couple of different avenues we can go here. I've been uh, preparing myself for a Justin Thomas Masters victory for some time now. I think when you start to look at JT and you look at the metrics, right? Does he hit it far enough? Sure, he does. He is a world-class ball striker. Uh, the putter always going to be the question, but when you start to look at his recent performances, you can see, well, gained three strokes putting at the Valspar. Gained 3.8 at Genesis, gained 1.2 at the Farmers. Give me any one of those putting performances from JT this week. He's probably going to finish inside the top five. His Masters history, phenomenal. Remember when he was trending? Last year, he entered the Masters, and we were saying, oh, JT's results have gotten better each and every year. 39th, 22nd, 17th, 12th, 4th. There's only one place for him to go. There's only one place for him to go. It's a top three finish in 2021, and he was on pace for that. He was playing awesome. Remember that rain delay that we got on Saturday? Well, uh, completely took the mojo from JT. I think he made a triple on, on 13, I think, which is like the easiest hole in the golf course, makes a triple uh, eight, I believe was the number he made, and just plays himself out of it on one hole. Still finishes T21. He played better than that T21 indicates. So this is, this is the guy I've been... Very excited about uh, for some time. JT getting back to Augusta National, this time with bones on the bag. He's $10,300. I believe he's going to be very, very popular. Maybe the most intriguing option is Rory McIlroy. Uh, you're going to get all the narrative around uh, him trying to complete the career grand slam for the seventh or eighth time. He misses the cut at the Valero, and you wonder what people are going to do with that. But at a, at a flat $10,000, Rory should be able to tap into his driver. That's his weapon. And honestly, he's putting well. The only concern that you have about Rory McIlroy right now, right now is the, the iron game. What's his approach play up to? Because he hasn't been super sharp. He was pretty bad at the Valero, right? Lost a stroke on approach over two rounds. Didn't putt it particularly well. Um, the around the green game's fine. It's just kind of a weird scenario. I liked that Rory did indeed play the Valero Texas Open, played his way into the Masters, played his way into shape. Maybe he can get out to a good start, but he's going to have to use his driver. The softer the conditions, honestly, the more rain they get at, at Georgia in Georgia this week is probably better for Rory McIlroy. And at $10,000, I'll be interested to see as the week goes on what people do with him, right? Will people opt to buy Rory or will they go higher or will they go lower? It's kind of an awkward pricing point. The other two guys that I, I love in this 10K range, and I would not fault you for playing, one is John Rahm. He's $10,800. The other is Dustin Johnson. Uh, when I start going through the trends for John Rahm at 10 8, I, I mean, the guy is just phenomenal, right? Like, let's just load this field in. You can even look at the last 20. Let's look at the last. Um, well, we can do this a couple ways. We can look at, like, the last 100 rounds, John Rahm is going to be near the top of the board. He is the top of the board. 1.85 strokes gained per round. More recently, 20 rounds, you're going to see he's much lower than that. In fact, he's actually 
23rd in the last 20 rounds, but he's still gaining 1.15 strokes to the field. That's incredible. And what he's done at Augusta National is downright dirty, right? Four consecutive top 10s, I, be I believe it is. Let me just pull this up and make sure that I have this correct. Um, the argument that you could make for Rom that I think is an intriguing one is uh, revolves around the putter. Yeah, there they are. A fourth, a ninth, a seventh, and a fifth for John Rahm at the Masters. He hasn't putted well. His short game's been a little weak this year. That's been kind of the downfall of his game. What if it's the Greens reading books, right? What What if that's why John Rahm basically almost in exact, uh, you know, coordination with the new year, does he struggle to start putting? Maybe it's the Greens readings books. Well, you don't have those this week. You never have those this week at Augusta National. Maybe that's what he needs, free his mind up a little bit, get back on track. Um, but DJ is probably more interesting. You know, we'll we'll see what the ownership is. These guys are all kind of awkwardly priced for me, right? Because you could make a case around each one. You could argue the question marks around them. But Dustin Johnson looks fit. And we're going to talk about another guy that looks fit in a second, but DJ coming around using the driver, that's his weapon, right? T9 at the Players' Championship, fourth at the WGC Dell Technologies match play. What do you see here? Basically gaining multiple strokes off the tee in five straight events, five straight measured events, and that doesn't even include the Saudi International where he finished T8, where you probably assume he drove the ball well to do that. We're seeing the ball striking back from DJ. This this is a really good model for him and obviously a place that he's had uh, plenty of success at over his career. Before we get too far down this board, I'd be remiss if I didn't just show you the course history for Augusta National dating back to 2008. So these are the strokes gained metrics. Will Zalatoris is number one. He only has four rounds played. He gained 3.2 strokes to the field. Last year, he finished runner-up. Jordan Spieth, no surprise, number two, 32 rounds under his belt. Uh, John Rahm is third. And when I was referencing John Rahm, the issue is when you start looking at everything uh, leading into this event or into major championships, you're going to see John Rahm's name pop up all the time, which is why, you know, we're what, two, re two weeks away from uh, a remove from him being the number one player in the world and everyone, myself included, saying that he's by far the best player in the world. Now he's had a couple of like okay finishes and, and we've forgotten about him uh John Rahm's getting over two strokes per round in his 20 rounds around Augusta National Tiger is next we'll talk about him in the next tier he's played 40 rounds but just see you know uh, John Rahm and DJ and Rory I mean those are the kings of of kind of course history here for that 10k 10k range that we talked about then obviously Jordan Spieth in there and Hideki Matsuyama and a guy I want to talk about next, Brooks Kepka for that 9K range. Those are the best guys in just pure course history dating back to 2008. Let's talk Brooks. Let's have the Brooks conversation. We've got to do it. We've, we've got to have the Brooks Kepka conversation. I am fairly all in on Brooks here. Okay. And there's a lot of reasons why uh, I believe this is probably the first time we're seeing Brooks healthy at the masters in a couple of years. Right. Remember, he could barely read his putts at the Masters last year. It's just so it's so nuts how far we've come. And look at these metrics now. We're starting to get good Brooks again. Gains five off the tee in Phoenix, two at the Honda, one at the players, and he missed the cut. He was on the wrong end of the draw. Two and a half the Valspar. Gains off the tee at the match play. Those numbers are a bit wonky for the match play, but they are official strokes gain numbers. Makes a deep run there. So you're seeing the good ball striking again. Multiple strokes on approach in four out of his last six. We're seeing that come around. Look, look at this stat profile where it's led by solid ball striking. That is much more reminiscent, if I scroll down, of this time frame right here. Doesn't that look somewhat similar? Multiple strokes off the tee, multiple strokes on approach, still questions in the short game, no doubt about it, still questions there. This stretch that I'm referring to was last summer. Uh, a couple of notable finishes during that stretch, runner-up at the WGC Workday, runner-up at the PGA Championship, T4 at the U.S. Open, sixth place finish at the Open Championship. We don't know what he did because we don't get the, the, the strokes gained breakdown at the Open Championship, but that's still the time frame where he was playing very similar to what he's doing right now. You look at the Masters history, right? Outside of last year, which he was certainly not healthy, uh, he's been awesome. 
T7 in 2020, runner-up to Tiger in 2019, probably should have won that. T11 in 2017, his major championship history, that was the other thing that I was doing here. Um, and this is in an, another video that I created as well. But let's just go look up the uh, strokes gain dating back to 2008 for all the major championships. You got PGA Championship, Masters, Open Championship, and the U.S. Open. What name do you think is going to reign supreme here? Well, it's Harry Higgs, but that's only four rounds. Brooks Kepka, 2.1 strokes gained in 113 major championship rounds. That's ungodly. Colin Morikawa is worse than that a little bit. Two strokes gained per round, which is an incredible number. 30 rounds. He's got two major wins. I, I mean, it's it's just so... Hard. I mean, it's not hard to quantify. It's just hard to explain how good that actually is. And I, I think I'm just all in on Brooksy this week. If it's not Brooksy, who is it? Um, Patrick Cantlay as a, a viable pivot option, I'm intrigued about. I'm kind of a sucker for this guy, so you can just ignore this section if you don't like Patrick Cantlay. But uh, he was one of the hottest players on the planet until just a couple of months ago. Uh, getting him back on, on bent grass, I think, is great. He would low-key be... Just your sneaky option who could absolutely win this golf tournament. We also have to have the Jordan Spieth conversation. And the problem with Spieth, well, it is a lot. Uh, I, I don't know what the general public is going to do. I think my exposure to Jordan Spieth is generally going to be uh, ownership-based. Because you get a lot of general fans in. You're going to have a lot of Spieth fans in here. Uh, the good news is, and of course the guy goes out and gains seven strokes from tee to green in the final round, the Valero Texas Open. Of course he does because it's you know one of his best tee to green rounds in five or six years just to give us the taste of what we could get of Jordan Spieth. But here's the real concern. Lost seven strokes putting at Valero. Seven. It's not a typo. Seven. Is that his worst putting performance ever? Let's see. Yep. Worst putting performance ever last week at the Valero. Second worst putting performance ever the week before at the match play. Again, a little bit of wonky data, but like we're in a fairly historically bad putting stretch from Jordan Spieth. Loses two strokes to the Players' Championship, 3.2 in Phoenix, 2.25 at the Farmers. I'm worried about this, but I think the case to be made is... Um, and I've made this case before, when Jordan, what drives Jordan is not the putter, it's actually the approach play. And we have that right now. And if there was any place for him to speed magic it up, it would be Augusta National to find the putter there. So... I think for me, Spieth is purely ownership based. We'll track it over the course of the week. We'll know, um, you know, in a few days, especially by the Wednesday live chat, 3 p.m. Eastern time on the Rick Run Good YouTube channel, what we're going to do with Jordan Spieth. So Kepka, Cantlay, Spieth, probably my favorites. I think Cameron Smith will be uh, likely too popular, and I do wonder if he's long enough uh, for a course that might play 7,700 yards or something like that. I could get burned if I do. I'm probably fine with it. I'd prefer. Uh, Zalatoris over most other guys in the group, or just Xander if I wanted to be kind of super safe, and we'll see what his ownership number is. Uh, Bryson, in theory, I think could could really uh, be like 6% owned and just and just win this thing. There's part of me that thinks that. Unfortunately, I just don't think he's healthy, right? You know, the, the wrist injury, I think it is, um, I don't want to say worse than he's leading on. I just don't think he's as close as he might be leading on. And we saw him just spray it all over the yard at the Valero. The other issue with Bryson is that when he does miss, he generally misses left. A left miss at at, at Augusta National is deadly. Uh, and he can get himself in a lot of trouble. So the good thing is if you play Bryson in 10% of your lineups, you might have leverage on the field. We'll see that over the course of the week. But um, likely too high risk to stomach in any in any sizable way. The $8,000 range. Fascinating and this is where I believe you get all your leverage. It's a small $8,000 range. It goes from Louis Oosthuizen to Terrell Hatton. I think all the leverage is here for a couple of reasons. You have you have some question marks, you have some debutants, you have some guys that I don't think are going to be super popular and then you have Tiger Woods who might just suck up Way more ownership than he should, right? You haven't had a chance to play Tiger in like 17 months. Of course, everybody's going to want to play Tiger. Even if he comes in at 12% owned, that's probably sucking up more ownership than he should. Here's the Tiger rant, and I'll, I'll pull up his golfer profile, and I'll try to make this very quick because I'm already on the record for this 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 um, this year. 
or this week, excuse me. I've been trying to put the puzzle pieces together on Tiger. I believe that he is in better shape than he is leading on, even if it's just by a small bit. I believe he's in a little bit better shape than he's leading on. Even in December, the club head speed was there. Uh, now it's just a matter of him, I guess, walking for four rounds. I don't know. I think I think he's going to be better than he's leading on. Additionally, um, there is a path to him making the cut that I do not think is all that outrageous because of the small field, how many guys are going to make the cut, the amateurs, the past champions, the fact that he's smarter than everybody else at Augusta National, and because I think he's going to be better than we are expecting. But I don't, I, I, I don't realistically see a guy who hasn't competed in 17 months contending. And especially as this week goes on and he starts to get more tired and the body starts to act up and it might be a little bit chillier than you would expect in, in Georgia. Like I, I don't, I, I see a scenario in which he makes the cut and then finishes like 53rd or something like that. I, I don't think that's out of the, the range of possibilities. In fact, I have already made two bets. I've bet, um, him to play and I've bet him on plus money to make the cut those are what I think the best the best options are and I can avoid paying $8,500 for Tiger Woods because objectively as much as I, I want Tiger to win this more than anybody trust me playing an $8,500 Tiger Woods when Sam Burns who's won three times in the last 12 months is $8,600 when Sung Jae who finished runner-up here is $8,400 when Adam Scott who finished Who's, who's won a green jacket is 83. Joaquin Neiman is 80. It's just, it's impossible to do, especially when he is going to be more owned than he should be. If I get burned by a Tiger Woods victory, thank God, I will be doing cartwheels in my living room, but I don't think that you can actually play him at $8,500 and think that that's an optimal play. The leverage in this 8K range, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, so I'm going to spend some time on it. Go over to the Trends tool. Um, this is a new version of the Trends tool, and what it does is it lets you put in any number of rounds and compare it to a golfer's 100-round baseline. So I have the last 20 rounds in here. I like that. It, it, it gives you enough. Look at who basically the hottest player is. Uh, Shane Lowry. Shane Lowry is a stroke better off the tee and a stroke better on approach in his last 20 than he is in his last 100. And the, the counterpoint would be, well, Rick, doesn't that mean regression's coming? Yes and no. Generally, the regression comes with the putter. So a guy who is only head and shoulders above his baseline with the putter, that regression's coming. We've seen the ball striking categories be a little bit stickier. So Shane Lowry, who is basically two strokes better in the ball striking categories than his baseline, that's pretty darn exciting. He's already won a major championship in his career. He's contending. He's playing well. That's exciting. Taylor Gooch, um, I think already we're seeing this sentiment that Gooch is way overpriced here, which I believe is going to—I I, I think he's going to be super low-owned. I don't know. I think Augusta National is a pretty good spot for him, right? I mean, he is— his best attribute is the approach play, which we know this is going to turn into a second-shot course. His worst attribute is uh, his driver. But his worst attribute is his driving accuracy, 94th in accuracy, but 65th in driving distance. So he loses his strokes because he sprays it. Well, we already know you can hit the fairways out here. It's not it's not that hard. So his 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 best strength is um, magnified, and his weakness is not that important. Also, I love this stat here: three putt avoidance. Um, these undulating greens where, you know, they're, they're, um, so nuanced and you've got to be so good. They lead to a lot of three putts. A guy like Gooch who doesn't three putt well, or who doesn't three putt often, I think is kind of sneaky good here. I think it's kind of sneaky good. Finished T7 at the Arnold Palmer, tough course, deep field. I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, that's where I think the leverage is. I think the leverage is on Gooch. I think the leverage is on Lowry. Um, really, anybody not named Tiger Woods. Sam Burns, who's won three times, now making his debut. Would you be all that surprised to see Sam Burns contend? Probably not. Would you be all that... Um, like, I love the rest of this 8K range. Sung Jae, who finished runner-up here last year, although his recent form hasn't been great coming in. Adam Scott, who's been much better coming in, and he's got the great course history here. Um, and then Joaquin Neiman, who... I mean, I love all these guys. Even Terrell Hatton, who finally broke through and had a good uh, year last year for the first time, finishing T18. Before that, Augusta National was kind of a, a Rubik's Cube that he couldn't solve. Uh, but Joaquin Neiman falls into the category of, like, the course comp guys. So, 
uh, Andy Lack, who writes for uh, RickRungood.com and does a, a great job on his on his own podcast, and we do a scramble together. I actually had written down what I thought the three course comps were, and I listened to his podcast, uh, which I don't usually do, but it came out early. I usually don't listen to anything, especially before I uh, I do this, but I do read it. I like to read Andy's article, and I listened to it, and the three courses that he named were the three that I had written down. Kapalua, Riviera, Muirfield Village. Those are three really good comps. Let's go. So, so Neiman, who what played well at Tournament of Champions, won at Riviera. Let's let's throw those comp courses into the Holy Grail and see what we can find. Yeah. So here are those comp courses. Uh, John Rahm of guys with a sample size number one again. Right, forty-one rounds played at those courses. You know, he's won at the Memorial. Uh, actually, so because I'm using strokes gained, you get the advantage of um, the WD at the Memorial. Remember when he was up like five or six shots and had to withdraw on Saturday night? Uh, because I'm using strokes gained, that helps him, which I think is important because he should get credit for those rounds he played. He, you shouldn't look at his average finishing position and see the WD. You shouldn't. He played better than that. So, uh, you know, ha- has a bunch of top tens at uh, the Tournament of Champions, all that good stuff. Patrick Cantlay's number two, Colin Morikawa number three, Xander four, Justin Rose five. Then you get to DJ and Rory and Scotty Scheffler. But then you get Adam Scott, Jordan Spieth, Joaquin Neiman. 30 rounds on those courses for Neiman. He's got the win at the Genesis, a fifth at the Tournament of Champions, a sixth at the Memorial. He's got a couple of missed cuts in there, but, like, this could be a low-key interesting spot. I... I think this 8K range is where the million dollars is won, right? You're playing the Millie Maker, the 8K range, it's where it's at. It's the perfect combination of lack of experience, guys that nobody wants nobody wants to play. There's good options that I think will be un, will not be uncovered by people. And then Tiger Woods steals everything else. Love the leverage of the 8K range. The $7,000 range doesn't get me as excited. I think people are going to gravitate to generally the same golfers here. We'll see what the deal is with Abraham Answer, right? was very popular last week with Drew on Wednesday evening with kind of a nondescript, I was forced to withdraw. Uh, so we'll see what, what the deal is for this week. Uh, I think people will uh, flock to Matt Fitzpatrick. That is, it's well warranted. Fitzpatrick's been awesome. His master's career uh, could be better, but he's he's been great. He's hot. He's a top 10 machine, all that good stuff. Um, I think people will flock to Corey Connors. Corey Connors has been the most valuable golfer in multiple starts at uh, the um, at the Masters. Now, he gets a... A uh, little bit of a price increase because I think he was like 6,600 and 6,900 in previous years. So he gets a little bit of a price increase, but still one of the more valuable golfers um, if you go to the Holy Grail and look that up. Uh, I believe uh, some of the other most valuable golfers were Mark Leishman, which is kind of interesting. So Leishman's gone 9th, 49th, 13th, and 5th, and his salary this year is actually kind of similar to the salary that we saw from those more valuable years. The guys that I'm focusing on, Russell Henley, I think, is very interesting. You know, Henley's put together three really good rounds at a time. He's not always put four rounds together at a time. And I I know it's kind of hard to ask him to do that at the Masters, a place that he hasn't played in a couple of years, but he's a Georgia guy. He knows this area. He has played this event before. He just hasn't played it as recently. Let me um let me run. I mean, even the last 20 rounds for everybody in this field. Russell Henley's 17th. He's been better than Patrick Cantlay. He's been better than Corey Connors. He's been better than Paul Casey. He's been better than John Rahm. Uh, the approach numbers are probably even better than that. They are. He's like sixth, right behind Justin Thomas, gaining a stroke per round. Even if you go last 50 on approach, I bet you Henley gets better. He does. He's second to only Victor Hovland. Last 50 rounds, Russell Henley's the 14th best player in this field. So it's just getting that fourth round put together which I suppose is a concern, but at 7800 bucks, you don't need Russell Henley to win. If you get a um, a 15th place finish or an 11th place finish like he did in 2018 and 2017, you're probably feeling pretty good about him. Let me show you a guy that concerns me a little bit, uh, Jason Kokrak. So basically almost directly in line with the Greens reading books being banned, uh, Kokrak has really struggled with the putter. So maybe he figures it out here, but his 2022 putting numbers are not good. And that was the one thing that really unlocked him in 2021, which is, uh, you know, a little bit of a concern uh, for, for Kokrak. And then you look at his history here and he's got a miscut and a 49th place finish. So that's probably not someone I'm super interested in. Uh, Siwoo, 
I can get behind Siwoo. Not a particularly big Siwoo Kim fan, but this is a second shot course. He had a decent finish here last year. I can show you the numbers. Let me pull this up real quick. Um, can get hot, right? Like nobody's ceiling is as high as Siwoo's and nobody's floor is as low as Siwoo's. But this is now gaining strokes off the tee in every event dating back to the Century Tournament of Champions, actually dating back even into last year into the Summit Club, the CJ Cup. Uh, approach play, he can get it hot. He can get it cold. Like, we, we know that. Let's look at his Masters history. Let's see what he's done at the Masters. Siwoo Kim, last year, T12. Three of his last four trips, top 25s. All of his last four have been top 35s. Gained 8.5 strokes on approach last year. That is an unofficial number, though I stand by it. Uh, calculated by... Uh, my buddy, Nelson Adcock, who is a genius uh, and runs uh, CutSweats.com. So you should go sign up for CutSweats. It's the only other service that I pay for and follow them on Twitter. Nelson's awesome. I'm going to try to get him to uh, do the strokes gain metrics again for me. We'll see if I can get him to do it. But he is uh, brilliant. So I, I definitely stand by those numbers, even though they're not official. They come off of the shot-by-shot -shot data, which is, which is the key there. The X factors in the 7K range. Uh, Webb Simpson at 7,500. You know, a normal, healthy, rocking and rolling Webb Simpson has been phenomenal at Augusta National. 20th, 5th, 10th, and 12th in his last four trips. Even the 2020 super soft version where Webb should not have contended, uh, he did. And if it plays even longer this year, I think it hurts Webb. But, like, I think he's the X factor because nobody cares about him. And then um, Robert McIntyre at $7,000. Finished 12th here last year, playing well coming in. A couple of, you know, a 35th place finish at the Valero. Didn't get out of his group at the match play. That's okay. I can pull up his golfer profile page and we can look at his DP World Tour stuff as well. But remember this whole, I don't even know if it's a narrative or like a real thing, that these lefties, there's something about Augusta National and how it plays to lefties. Uh, because you've got just the, the, the way that the fairways uh, shift. Obviously, Phil's got multiple green jackets, and uh, Bubba's got multiple green jackets, and Mike Weir, right, as well. I mean, it, it's just, it's a thing. It's a thing. And you look at the DP World Tour stuff, and even, I mean, the Genesis, he was T15 at the Genesis. There's a comp course. Top 10 uh, in February at a Euro Tour event. Back-to-back -to -back, top 50. I mean, he's played great. He's played great. And he's got a little bit of history here. And if you like that lefty narrative thing, let's go for it. Flat, flat min, $7,000. And then finally, the sixes. I don't, I got to admit, I don't love the sixes. I think Brian Harmon, again, lefty who finished 12th here last year and finished fifth at Valspar, I think is kind of interesting. Georgia Bulldog, I think, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, Again, this course is going to be really, really long. I'd love to say Cam Champ. Cam Champ's just not been playing all that well, although he's got a couple of good finishes here. If you just want to buy pure distance, I think Cam Champ is interesting. Um, you know, distance and playing well recently, Sepp Straka, right? One at Honda, finished top 10 at the Players, finished 15th at the Genesis, 16th at the Farmers. Those are tough courses. I don't mind Sepp Straka. I don't even mind Thomas Peters all that much. Not super stoked for it, but... I think it's fine. Um, who else do we have? Those are probably the guys I'm most excited about. I don't think I'm super excited about anybody else here. They're just not, they're just not playing well enough. And then you get to the past champions. So that's where I'd go in the 6K range. Let's run a model. Let's run a model and see what that pumps out. So this is uh, the custom model over at rickrungood.com. Um, I want to go probably pretty recent, maybe 16 or 20 rounds, or maybe split the difference on 18, last 18 rounds. And let's be real here. Let's make like a really wonky model, and we can redo this on the live shows later this week. But let's just say, um, like, I, let's say distance is paramount, right? So let's say distance is 25. And let's say weighted uh let's say weighted stroke no let's just say stroke skate approach is another 25 so now we've got let's do weighted stroke skate approach so what the weighted stuff is that's my calculation that is using strength of field amongst other things like if you gain because we are at a major i think weighted's important because uh you don't want to get into a situation where you are giving the same credit of of uh, gaining two strokes on approach in bermuda as gaining two strokes on approach at the u.s open so let's do weighted strokes gain so that's 50 now i do think it's an all a good all-around test so we're going to do 10 around the green and 10 on putting whoops 10 on putting 
Let's do... So that leaves us with 30. 30. 30, 30, 30. Let's do... Um, I mean, I could argue par 4 scoring. People will say the 5s are the path to victory. I'm not sure I 100% agree with that. You've got you've to survive the 4s. The 4s will eat you. They'll eat your lunch. Let's say... 20 on par 4. 10 on par 5. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. My number one golfer with these parameters is, <laughs> oh boy, Justin Thomas. Yeah, I mean, that's like the guy that I, if you, like, whenever, I talk to a lot of people, like, who are not in golf, and they're always like, oh, who do you like for the, who's going to win the Masters? I'm always like, and for the last couple of months, I've been like, Justin Thomas. Just just Justin Thomas. Justin Thomas. Justin Thomas. So, uh, no surprise to see that. Scotty Scheffler, number two. Impressive. Cam Smith, number three, just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely using a small sample size, so these guys are getting a lot of weight there. Xander is four, Victor is five, Sam Burns is six, Joaquin Neiman is seven. Is Neiman going to be like the sneaky guy I play this, this week? Um, Rory is eight, Cam Young is nine, Hideki is ten. We don't even know if Hideki is going to play. He's dealing with that back injury. We'll see. Um, other notables, Kepka is 17, Henley's 14, Cantley's 12, Rom's 11. I don't mind this. I don't mind this. We can make um we can make some more models later in the week, but I think this is a pretty decent one. I, I think later in the week, Wednesday, somebody remind me, uh, we'll we'll do some like draft kings points gained and we'll do like birdie or better and stuff like that. We'll just kind of work in the fantasy points. But there you go. How sweet is this? I could go on for two more hours, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it there. Uh lots of content coming this week. Make sure you're subscribed. Let me know who you think's gonna win. Let me know whatever you want in the comments. Like this week is it's it's all about you guys. The support that I've received has been unbelievable um over the last couple of years, and I, I just can't wait for some more. So tweet me at Rick Rungood, leave a comment below. Best of luck this week. And I'll talk to you guys soon.